Greetings everyone, it's time to take a look at bipolar junction transistors, or BJTs. This is a three-layer semiconductor device. Essentially what we're going to do is take some N material, P material, N material, make a sandwich out of it. So on this end, it's going to be N material, same on this end, in the middle is P material. Now it's possible to make the inversion of this, PNP, rather than NPN. If you understand how one works, the other one is fairly easy to grab onto. So I'm just going to focus on the NPN initially. We attach a couple of wires to this. Now the transistor is not literally made this way, um, like a sandwich. It's actually made more in layers. But this is a good visual, so we'll just continue with this. The three uh, connections are going to be called the emitter. Let's use a capital E for that. The base. And the collector. Now, remember, N material has a surplus of electrons. And P material has a surplus of holes. And of course, at the interface of these two, we get some recombination. We have an area that is depleted of free charge. And so we have a depletion region here, and we have a depletion region here. And so with diodes, that creates an energy hill. All right, how does this little configuration work? Well, if you look at this sort of simplistically, you might say, well, look, that's PN, PN, isn't that like a diode? In other words, you might think to yourself, well, that's basically this, right? You've got your N NP and PN junctions. Is that the same thing? Well, in some cases, it can, in fact, be um, analyzed that way. But there's a very important distinction, right? The fact that this P material is contiguous. It's not like it's a piece of P material and a wire and another piece of P material, which is what we're talking about here. But this is actually useful in terms of um, explaining at least partially how this thing is going to work. So what we're going to do is uh, attach a couple of power supplies and some resistors. Basically, some current limiting resistors over here. Now I have options on my polarities for my sources. So I'm just going to set this up like so. All right now, again, emitter, base, collector. So this would be our emitter power supply. This would be our collector power supply. Base would be at the common point here. Now, Look at the polarity of these two power supplies. They reverse bias these diodes. All right, so this is a reverse bias. This is a reverse bias in these two loops. All right? This loop, this loop. What ends up happening? Well, current in both sides, in other words, in the emitter side and the collector side, is zero. And if you take an actual BJT and you hook it up like this, that's exactly what's going to happen. Okay. What happens if we do the opposite? What if we flip the power supplies? So make this guy negative. Now what do we see? Well, these are both forward biased. And if you wanted to figure out the individual currents, right? You know, here you've got a loop like this. Here you've got something like this. Um, you would take your power supply, subtract the forward drop on the diode, 7 tenths of a volt if it's silicon, and divide that by your current limiting resistor. Right? So, for example, this current over here would be this power supply. Uh, let's just 
Um, we'll call that uh, VCC for collector power supply. So this current would be VCC minus approximately 0.7 volts for the diode. And that would be divided by this resistor. We'll call that the collector resistor. That would get you the current. Same thing would happen over here on the emitter side. All right, so what happens if we have one forward and one reversed? Okay, now you might expect a small current on one side and a large current on the other. In fact, that doesn't happen. Something entirely different happens. Let's take a look at uh, our original circuit back here. So I'm just going to add our resistors. I'll call this the emitter resistor like I did over there. This will be the collector resistor. And I'm going to set that up so that I have a forward bias on this side and a reverse bias on this side. Right, so here's my emitter power supply, VEE. Base is going to come straight down. And then over here, we'll have our VCC. Alrighty. Okay, so again, this is forward biased. This junction, the collector base junction, is reverse biased. So to make this a little bit more obvious, I am going to use electron flow here. Here's what ends up happening on the emitter side. The electrons are going to leave the negative terminal. They enter the end material where they are the majority carrier. If there is sufficient voltage, in other words, sufficient electrical pressure, we can hop the depletion region. The electrons wind up in the P base. Now, some of those electrons are going to recombine with the holes, right? You can think of the electrons as sort of dropping into the holes. And that produces an exit current, sometimes called a recombination current, your base current. However, this region is thin and lightly doped and there simply isn't enough time for all of these electrons to fall into holes the vast majority of them maybe 98 99 plus percent wind up going into the collector again where they're the majority carrier and they will simply return back to the collector supply okay so, <clears throat> as percentages go, like I said, the vast majority goes from the emitter into the collector, right? So the electrons are emitted into the emitter, appropriately named, and then they're collected back up at the collector, and that's where the names come from. Okay, so what do we see here? Well, you know, some of the basic ideas are that, uh, you know, Kirchhoff's current law must still be true, so IE would have to equal... IC plus IB, right? That's just basic uh, Kirchhoff's current law. Um, but if this percentage is very close, right? If IC is, you know, 99% of IE, then you can say that the emitter and the collector currents are approximately the same size. Okie doke. Now, put some figures of merit on here. We talk about uh, the percentage that actually gets through into the collector. That's called alpha. So alpha is defined as collector current divided by emitter current. Another way of defining this is between a ratio of the two exiting currents, the collector uh, and the base. We call that beta. So beta is defined as IC over IB. Right? Okay. Now, before we go any further, let's do a little demonstration because sometimes people have a hard time with this idea of the electrons sort of, you know, falling into the holes and, you know, the percentages. Sometimes it's hard to grab your mind around. So we're going to call up on an old friend, our old electron buddy, and what I've done is I've created a little sort of model, kind of a cheesy little cardboard box model of the base, essentially. So over here we have the emitter, and over here is the collector. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some 
um, electrons. We're going to pass them through here. These are the available holes, literally, right, in the base. And the electron will come through, you know, might find a hole, in which case we have a recombination current. Otherwise, it's going to come through off of the collector. All right. So we're just going to run a little experiment here and see, uh, you know, what we wind up with. Okay. All right. First, a bunch of electrons. I've got 10 of them. Second, I've got a little box over here to hold the electrons when they fall through the holes. All right, now, we have three nicely widely spaced holes. And you would expect, you know, just looking at this quick, that a fair percentage of these electrons you know, would fall into these holes. So let's find out. My little bag over here on the side so these don't go all over the desk. Oh, look at that. None of them. Not a single one fell through, right? Out of 10. Well, if we ran this many times, and as you can guess, I have, um, you would find that, you know, typically one or none would actually make it through there. Um, even though there's three and they're nicely spaced, there simply isn't enough time for those golf balls, our electrons, to find a hole and fall right through, to have just the right energy level in our analogy. Okay, so we find that, you know, typical values for these transistors, alphas are, you know, 0.99. 0 0.98, 0 0.995, something like that. And those translate into betas of maybe 100, 200, something along that line. Now, knowing one, you can find the other. It's a relatively straightforward process to do. Again, if we remember Kirchhoff's current law, right? So alpha is defined as IC over IE, beta IC over IB. So we could rearrange these a little bit and say that IC is equal to alpha times IE. We could also say that IC is equal to beta times IB. So if I look at alpha, right, that's defined again as IC over IE. I'm just going to make some substitutions in here. So we know that IE is IC plus IB. But we also know that IC is beta IB. And I can factor out that IB down here. And we would find that alpha is equal to beta over beta plus 1. So if you're beta was 100, right, then your alpha is 100 over 101. In other words, just a shy bit over 0.99, right? 99% of the injected electrons are going to wind up in the collector. Similarly, we could look at beta. All right, so beta is IC over IB. And IC we know is alpha IE. IB can be written according to Kirchhoff's current law, IE minus IC. Okay, so IC again, alpha IE. And now you can factor out your IE values, and you find out that beta is equal to alpha divided by 1 minus alpha. So if you had an alpha of, let's say, 0.98, right, 98%, then beta is 0 0.98 divided by 1 minus 0 0.98, which is um, 0 0.02 or a beta of 49. 
All right, now, practical end of this. Very often, we're going to use the base as the input, and then the emitter collector is the output. Now remember, the green over here, that's electron flow. That's why I did it in dotted line. Conventional flow, current goes into the base, into the collector, out of the emitter, right? This still works, KCL still works, but that's conventional flow. So typically what we do is we control the base current and that acts as kind of like a lever uh, amplifying the uh, current characteristic, right? Essentially, this right here. So we can make a little model, right? If we think of IB as the input, right? Sort of the little part of the lever that we're going to push up and down, the collector becomes the output. So we make a model, very simple model for our transistor that relies on a current controlled current source. Right? Current controlled current source, and it looks something like this. We have our collector up here, emitter down here, base back here. The value of this current source, right, this is IC, is simply equal to beta times IB. So we put in some base current. There is a beta value, maybe 100, 200, whatever it is, that amplifies up whatever the base current is, and that produces a big collector current. And for our bias calculation, we just consider the base emitter as the forward biased diode, right? Remember the emitter base is forward biased. So this we can approximate is about seven tenths of the volt, call it a day. So the voltage from collector to base, we don't necessarily know like this because that is of course a reverse biased diode. So, you know, what is that? Well, that's gonna depend on what the surrounding resistors and power supplies and so forth happen to be, right? Okay, so typical numbers for beta, small signal transistors, 100, 150, 200, maybe 250. For power transistors, because they're, you know, beefier, um, not quite as high, you know, maybe 50, something like that, 30, all depending. Okay, next time, what we're gonna do is take a look at some device curves. Right? As we vary voltages and currents, what kind of characteristics do we get? Right? We've done this for diodes. We know the typical diode curve. That's where the 0.7 comes from. So what actually happens with our bipolar junction transistors? See you then.